I met Tommy first. He was the most charming of the group. In his 20s, just like myself, but with a perspective on life that was way beyond his years. I was drawn to him by his charisma, but I felt nothing romantic for him. He was just a figure that I liked, so I drew closer to him. He told me about his music band. It's a group of four, so we're more than a crowd as it stands, but we can do with one more back and vocal, and I think you have the talent for it, he had said. I had said yes to him not realizing that from that point on, my life would change so much that every part of my being would be entwined with the band. We did everything together, and soon I fell in love with Mike. Mike was the drummer, and he was very good at what he did, just as everyone else. And soon we started a successful touring business, playing gigs across the country to keep the band operational. We had played for seven months before we got the deal to record another album for the company. The sum was the biggest the band had ever seen, Mike confided in me, and for some reason, he mentioned that things got better in his life since I came on board. You're my good luck charm, he would whisper to me, and it would make me feel so good. I can't lose you. If the rest of the band, Tom, Alex, and Jenny, felt that way, I had no way of knowing because they never told me about their finances or operations before I was brought on. There was no envy in the group because Alex and Jenny had a thing, and Tommy, the lead vocalist, would rather continue with his pursuit of different women every night than turn his eyes on either Jenny and I. So it made sense that I loved Mike just as Jenny loved Alex, leaving Tommy to his exploration. It did not matter much to us as long as we toured, until we stopped touring to record the project. Tommy called it the album of his life, and all of the perks that he desired were made possible by the company. He asked for the regular cabin home in the countryside, far away from the distractions of the inner cities to be arranged. Food and drinks would come every weekend through the same delivery person. We had television for entertainment, but to retain the purity of the process, no one would have internet or cell network except him. Seemed reasonable. And for the first week, Creativity and collaboration results proved Tommy's words true. It was the best time of our recording. But Mike felt different, and he told me about it. Mike confided in me about his concern for Tommy during our private conversation. His eyes underscored this worry. Tommy had always been the affable and charismatic leader of the band. What if things go wrong and we need to leave? Mike asked. Was it not manipulation that made us ride on Tommy's words against our own interests to settle in a secluded area of the world just to put out a record? Mike would say, and usually end his rants with the cryptic statement that he could not lose me. I did not think much of what was said the first time, even though it caused me some worry. But Mike's fears were relentless, and as the days passed, so did his concerns which he mentioned to me. The energy started to go awry by the end of the second week, and I could feel Mike slipping into a dark web that threatened to consume him if he did not snap out of it. In my worry and resolution to not talk to anybody about it, I had the recording company provide us with shrooms like those we took when we were on tour. It had been my desire that some time away from the group, alone at the waterfront, would heal his fears. We took the shrooms alone, as the rest of the group did not do them with us, and we headed to the lake, which was closest by a mile and a half away from the cabin. I had no idea how badly Mike had allowed the seclusion to affect him, but when we arrived at the beach, he seemed like a different version of himself. At first, he started drooling, with spit running down his lips as we sat quietly by the water, watching the dark clouds gather overhead. I asked Mike if he was okay. I love you, Olivia. I don't want to lose you too, he said to me. Even though it made me worry, I tried to comfort him by placing my right hand on his warm left hand. You won't lose me, Mike. I'll be here with you forever, I said. But Mike shook his head. I suspected it was a bad trip from the shrooms. You don't understand! His voice thundered into a yell and he leapt to his feet. 
I've been trying to tell you since we moved into that damn cabin! I hesitated to speak. The moment felt surreal, like a blend of dream and reality as I stumbled, struggling to distinguish between the two. Mike moved over and held my hands, his eyes teary and his lips quivering. I started to panic. The fact that the shrooms had hit me so terribly made the moment even more terrifying because Mike did not look much like himself anymore, but a shifting figure that was almost an otherworldly macabre in feature. I begged him to stop the torture, and instead he laughed. You're not the first backup vocalist we have had. Tommy likes to take his time with them, build trust, break them down bit by bit until he does it, Mike said, cackling. The son of a devil enchants them, worships them like a goddess in a ritual, takes them from behind and eventually fires them from the band. All the women I have loved. What are you talking about? I bawled, scared beyond my wit. The company always cleans the mess, but I can't let him do it to you. You are not to be the product of his ritualistic fetish. Mike continued. You're within cell range. Call the cops and I'll tell them you left. His crying did not stop until I did. I told the cops where the cabin was, and it was only then that Mike eased. When we returned, Tommy had been arrested, and I had my heart in my mouth as I got to know all about the past cases and the women who chose to speak. It struck me that if Mike had not confessed me on that bad shroom trip at the lake, I would have ended up like them. It was the most horrifying thing I had ever experienced in my life. Growing up, I used to be really close to my sister Holly. We did everything together. She was one year older than me, and we looked a lot alike, so strangers always assumed that we were twins. Eventually, Holly moved away to college while I stayed in our hometown. We still talked regularly on the phone, but I could feel Holly slowly start to pull away from me. Our daily phone calls got shorter and more sporadic until eventually we weren't talking at all. I didn't even know that Holly had dropped out of college until one of our mutual friends told me. I guess Holly had started dating a new guy named Alan who was a pretty bad influence on her. I'd never met him in person, but he was the kind of possessive boyfriend who wanted to control everything in his girlfriend's life, including who she talked to. Alan was also pretty religious, so he pressured her to quit school, marry him, and devote her life as a homemaker. Well, they didn't have any kids yet, but it was only a matter of time. After nearly two years of radio silence, I was starting to get desperate. I missed Holly a lot, but more than that, I was worried about her life choices. She was such a smart and talented person. She deserved better than to give everything up for a guy. Holly unfriended me on all her socials, and the only way I could keep tabs on her was by checking Alan's Facebook, which, thankfully, wasn't set to private. He posted regularly, and he always shared photos of the two of them hanging out with their new church friends. I'm the kind of person who tries to keep an open mind, but those photos really creeped me out. Everyone in Holly's life was either a blank-eyed housewife like her, or a controlling husband like Alan. It just seemed so unhealthy. This June, I found a very interesting post on Alan's page. It was an announcement about their upcoming Independence Day party. They were planning something big at their house for all their friends. Dozens of people left comments saying that they were going to attend. It seemed like the perfect opportunity for me to finally talk to Holly directly. I knew it was a risky plan. If I showed up uninvited, I knew that my sister's husband would immediately throw me out. But at the very least, I'd still get to see Holly. Even if she told me directly that she never wanted to see me again, at least I'd have closure. So I wrote down the time and location of the party. That was definitely a good decision, because the very next day, Alan had deleted the post completely. A few weeks later, the 4th of July rolled around, and I was ready. 
I bought bags of Swedish fish and candy corn, Holly's two favorite snacks. Their party started at noon, so I arrived a half hour later after most of their guests had already arrived. As I walked into the busy front yard, everything decorated with red, white, and blue, I saw at least a dozen couples just like Alan and Holly. The wives all had vacant expressions while the husbands drank and joked around. Weird chanting music was playing from the speakers. A few people saw me walk in, but they all looked away, as if they could sense that I wasn't one of them. That didn't stop me, though. I continued through the yard until I reached Holly, who was at a table refilling bowls of chips. Hey, I said. She spun around. I expected her to be shocked to see me, but I didn't expect her to look absolutely horrified. W what are you doing here? Can we talk? I asked. I figured if we sat down somewhere quiet, we could hash things out. But before Holly could answer, Alan walked over and wrapped his arm around her shoulder in a very territorial way. Then he looked me right in the eyes and said, we think you should leave. I anticipated that kind of reaction from him, and I was ready to stand my ground. She's my sister. If she wants me to leave, then I want to hear it from her. Alan squeezed Holly closer to him. She looked scared. Well, Holly, do you want me to leave? I pressed. The party is for our church, she explained. You wouldn't want to be a part of it. Why not? I asked. Because everyone here has found their soulmates, Alan explained. This party is meant for couples, so there's no space for you. Again, I told him that I wanted my sister to answer for herself. It's a very important day for us, Holly finally said. You wouldn't understand what we're about to do. I felt chills run down my spine. What we're about to do? What did that even mean? I got the horrible feeling that their group wasn't really a church at all. It sounded like a cult. It sounded like they were planning to drink poison Kool-Aid or something. Aside from all the American flags and patriotic decorations, there were a few church banners hanging from the porch. All of them had cryptic slogans like, We see through him, and he is watching, stuff like that. You're not going to hurt yourselves? I asked. Again, Alan started to answer, but this time, Holly stopped him. We're here to solidify our bonds, that's all. Then, after a long breath, she added, Please, leave. I had my answer. I wasn't welcome here, and I never would be. There was nothing I could say to make Holly change her mind. So, I said goodbye and left. But I didn't go home. Instead, I got in my car and drove to the next street. Then I parked and hid in the neighbor's yard behind some bushes. I wanted to see for myself what weird ritual they had planned. And if things looked dangerous, I'd call the police. I crouched there for a long time, watching as the couples ate their burgers in mostly silence. The men all seemed excited, but the women were still blank-faced. None of them ate until their husbands told them they could. It seemed deeply sexist, but nothing illegal was going on. And then the music stopped, and everyone gathered in the center of the yard. Alan seemed to be the leader. He stood on a water cooler so he was taller than everyone else, and he made a speech. The world is a horrid, hate-filled place. It's too much for the women in our lives to witness. If everyone's ready, it's time to begin. Immediately, the couples formed a line in front of Alan. The men were all holding scarves. Something terrible was about to happen. Alan looked down at the first couple, a short, bald man and his much more attractive wife. He spoke to the husband first. Do you vow to guide your soulmate on the right path? The man nodded. Then Alan turned toward the wife. And do you vow to always follow your soulmate's directions, to accept the world as he describes it to you? The wife nodded. Then Alan pulled out a bottle of Gorilla Super Glue. The wife stepped closer and waited. 
He poured three drops each in both of her eyes. She didn't react to the pain. With her eyes now shut closed forever, she whispered, Thank you. Then she stepped to the side, and her husband held her hands with a smile. Next, Alan shouted. The next couple stepped forward. I couldn't believe this was really happening. I'd heard of some awful religious rituals throughout the world, but I never imagined that women would choose to be blinded like that. I felt sick to my stomach. While Alan gave the same speech to the next couple, I pulled out my phone and called 911. Don't do that. I looked up, and I saw Holly standing behind me. She's found me. He's going to blind you, I said. I have to stop him. It's what we want, she said. If you stop us, we'll never ascend into perfect soulmates. I looked into her eyes. They were light blue, just like mine. Even though there was sadness and fear in her eyes, there was determination, too. I couldn't talk her out of it. So, I did the only thing I could do. I punched her right in the face. Before she could recover, I grabbed her and pulled her toward the street. She was struggling with me, but I got her in my car and I drove her straight to the police station. I took her inside, where I explained everything to the policemen. They sent some officers to the house, where they found a dozen blinded women and their husbands. Alan had gotten to every woman at that party, except Holly. Unfortunately, Alan had left before the police could catch him. Holly stayed at my house after that. Over time, I felt like I'd finally talked some sense into her. She seemed to finally accept that she had been brainwashed by her husband. Everything seemed to be going well. Until this morning. I woke up to find Holly had left in the middle of the night. I don't know where she is, but I know deep down that she went back to Alan. I'm terrified of what's going to happen to her. My sister Jennifer and I went to Lake Havasu for spring break this year. I was in my last year of college and I really needed a break. Jennifer planned everything out. She rented a Lexus so we wouldn't have to drive our own cars through the desert, and she picked out a hotel right on the lake. Our first day there was pretty great. We spent most of the time hanging out by the pool, which was a lot warmer than the cold lake water. Jennifer got a little drunk, so by the end of the night she was kind of embarrassing herself. I think the concierge noticed because she was glaring at us through the lobby window. Just before dinner time, Jennifer met another tourist, a really handsome ginger guy. She left with him to have dinner in one of the beachside restaurants. I was not invited. I ended up eating room service alone in our room and waiting for Jennifer to come back. She never did. When I woke up the next morning, I assumed that my sister was hooking up with that red-haired guy. Wouldn't be the first time she ditched me during a vacation. Just in case, though, I decided to go downstairs and ask the concierge if she'd seen Jennifer. I remembered how she glared at us the night before, so I was positive that she'd remember my sister. I found the woman standing behind the front desk in the lobby. Her name tag said, Maria. I politely introduced myself, but she already knew exactly who I was. You're the sister of that loud, drunk woman, aren't you? She wasn't wrong. Yes, I told her, but I'm worried that she's gone missing. She met this red-haired guy and... Maria's eyes widened in horror. She asked if the red-haired man had a snake tattoo on his arm. I nodded. He definitely had a snake tattoo. Oh my god! She said, you have to come with me. Before I could ask any questions, Maria abandoned her desk, grabbed my wrist, and raced through the lobby and into the parking lot. It all happened so suddenly, I didn't get a chance to find out what was going on. All I knew was that this woman thought my sister was in trouble. We got into her Jeep, and she sped onto the highway. As she drove, she explained that the man who took my sister was extremely dangerous. For months now, he'd been kidnapping tourists and taking them into the desert, where no one ever saw them again. 
Maria said that the man had already taken several guests from her hotel, though there was never enough evidence to arrest him. He was barred from the property, but apparently he snuck back in. Thankfully, Maria knew exactly where the man was hiding. If we were lucky, we'd get there before anything happened to Jennifer. I took out my phone to call 911, but Maria told me to stop. She said we could handle things on our own. I didn't like that idea, but everything was happening so fast that I didn't argue with her. She pulled her jeep up to a rundown trailer in an isolated area off the main road. It didn't look like anyone lived here. Maria got out of the car and walked straight to the trailer's door. She kicked it open. Hey! She shouted angrily. Honestly, she was acting like Maria Connor from the Terminator movies, all tough and angry. Huh, I was glad I had her on my side. I followed her inside the trailer. The ginger man stood frozen in the kitchen area, obviously scared by our sudden arrival. I... I, I didn't do anything, he said. He had his hands above his head. Where is she? Maria demanded. In the back, he muttered. I'll show you. With his hands still raised over his head, he walked through the trailer toward a door. Maria and I followed him. Slowly, he pushed open the door, revealing only darkness on the other side. It looked like a wooden shed that the man had built onto the back of the trailer. I couldn't see Jennifer. She's in there, the ginger man said. Look for yourself. I really wanted to see my sister, but I didn't trust this man for a second. Bring her out, I demanded. Maria walked around the man and wrapped something tight around his hands. I think she used a handkerchief. It's okay, she told me. Just go inside and check. I'll watch him. Thank God Maria was here. I pulled out my phone and turned on flashlight mode. I started to take it with me, but Maria told me to let her hold it with one hand so I could see better. As she held up the light behind me, I walked inside. The room was so dark, but I could see Jennifer lying in the corner. Her hair was in her face. I couldn't tell if she was alive. I ran to her and shook her shoulder, but then the whole room turned black before I could see her face. The door had closed behind me. Maria! I screamed. Let me out of here! I could hear my sister moaning. She was still alive, but barely conscious. Sorry, Maria said through the door. But I can't let you mess things up for my brother. I couldn't believe it. The man was her brother. They were a team. Through the door, she explained that her brother only kidnapped loud, obnoxious tourists that traveled here alone. He thought Jennifer was alone because that was what she'd told him back at the pool. He didn't expect someone like me to come looking for her. What are you going to do with us? The man started to laugh horribly. He said they were going to keep us in there until we died. No one would ever find us. You shouldn't have given me your phone, Maria taunted. I held Jennifer. She was covered in sweat from spending so long in this room. Her arms were trembling. Outside the door, I could hear the siblings talk casually. It sounded like they were congratulating each other. Like they were fishermen, we were fish. What they didn't know was that I had a second phone in my back pocket. I always kept it for emergencies. I dialed 911 as soon as they left the trailer. In less than 30 minutes, we were rescued. Jennifer is still recovering in the hospital, but it looks like she's going to be okay. I hadn't seen my friend Becky in a while. We used to be roommates, but I moved out after she started snipping at me all the time. I didn't know what I did to make her angry, but we kind of lost contact for a bit. Recently, we started to reconnect. After hanging out with her a couple times, all that awkwardness between us was gone. Unfortunately, I really didn't like her new boyfriend, Tyrone. He seemed really sketchy. One night, I invited Becky over to watch our favorite Netflix show. Its latest season had just come out. I won't tell you what the show was because it's pretty embarrassing. 
but it meant a lot to us. We used to watch it together all the time before we moved out. I was excited when she arrived at my front door with her new friend Sadie. Unfortunately, they brought Tyrone too. He walked in carrying a tray of veggie snacks, but he didn't look like he wanted to be there. His expression was dead serious. Sadie seemed nice, if a bit weird. She was one of those new agey type of people that only talked about wellness and stuff. I guess she and Becky had met in some yoga retreat. There were a few times I got some weird I'm in a cult vibes from her, but I knew I was just jumping to conclusions. Tyrone, on the other hand, I didn't like him at all. He had these really angry, dark eyes, and he kept staring at me from the other side of the room. After the four of us sat for a while, I announced that I needed to go to the kitchen to bring back more snacks. We already had plenty of food on the tables, but I needed an excuse to get away from Tyrone. Unfortunately, he followed me into the other room. Hey, he said, looking over his shoulder to make sure Becky couldn't hear us. I ignored him, so he stepped closer and cornered me against the fridge. I tried to push him away, but he grabbed me by the shoulders and got right in my face. Listen, he whispered. I was terrified. My friends were just one room away, and I was too scared to scream. If Tyrone wanted to, he could snap my neck before Becky and Sadie even got off the couch. Don't hurt me, I whimpered. I'm not, he said. Then realizing that he was acting pretty threatening, so he let go of my shoulders, but he still had me cornered. You're in danger. You have to believe me. Becky shouted from the other room. Is there a problem? No, Tyrone answered for me. He turned towards me, his dark eyes looking so desperate. I had to hear him out. Listen, we don't have a lot of time. I looked at Becky's phone and she was texting Sadie. They're going to hurt you tonight. I'm not sure what, but they're planning some kind of cruel plank. The only reason I came was to stop them and to warn you. I don't really know you, but I know you don't deserve whatever those girls are planning. I didn't believe him. Ever since I met him, I just felt bad vibes off of him. When we re-entered the living room, Becky took one look at us and knew that something had happened. Tyrone, what did you tell her? I only wanted to... Becky started pushing him towards the front door as he tried to reason with her. She shoved him out of my house and locked the door behind him. Then she walked back towards me and apologized. I never should have invited him. He's always messing with my friends. It felt great to see Becky stand up for me like that. The old Becky would have automatically chosen her boyfriend over me, but I guess that she was different now. She filled us in on what we missed on the TV. Everything went back to normal surprisingly quickly. It felt so comfortable to sit with them and make jokes about the show. It didn't take me long to forget about the weirdness with Tyrone. I still didn't understand what kind of game that he was playing, but it didn't seem to matter now. After another episode, the show went to credits. Becky grabbed the remote and hit pause. She stretched and said that she wanted to take a walk outside to stretch her legs. I'm in, Sadie said jumping up. I was fine on the couch, but I figured why not join them? It was better than being alone. Sadie and I followed Becky outside. It was a beautiful night. The moon was full. Becky stopped walking. She turned towards Sadie and whispered, It's time. Then both Sadie and Becky turned towards me. Their eyes looked so blank as Becky pulled out a knife from her overalls. I don't know what Tyrone told you, but maybe you should have listened, Becky said. I knew they were joking, but their expressions looked serious. <laughs> Come on, I said. That obviously isn't real. I grabbed Becky's knife by the blade and tried to pry it out of her hand. I instantly pulled my hand back. The knife was real, and now I had a gash on my palm. Why? I whimpered because I've always hated you. And she jabbed the knife right into my stomach. Sadie jumped up and down, giggling and clapping. My legs gave way, 
and I fell to the ground in seconds. I'd never felt such intense, searing pain. My stomach throbbed horribly, and I could feel blood oozing down my shirt. Becky stood over me with a triumphant smile. She nudged me with her foot. The knife was poking out of my stomach. She bent down and pulled out the knife and stabbed me again. When someone came out of the shadows and tackled her to the ground, it was Tyrone. He'd come back to protect me. As he knocked Becky to the ground, Sadie jumped on his shoulders and clawed at him. She was a small woman, and he had no problem slamming her into the ground right on top of Becky. With both of them on the ground, Tyrone turned toward me and scooped me in his arms. I don't remember what happened next, but when I woke up a few hours later, I was in a hospital bed with Tyrone by my side. I was going to be okay. The police never found Becky or Sadie. I don't know where they are or if they'll ever come back, but I'm not too worried. I don't live by myself anymore. I've moved in with Tyrone and I've never been happier. My boyfriend Jeremy and I were on a cross-country trip from California to Virginia. We'd been in a very happy relationship for three years, so I assumed it would be a great experience. It wasn't. By the third day when we were driving through the ugly New Mexico desert, we started snapping at each other. He didn't like the music I wanted to play. I was annoyed at his loud gum chewing. It was all very minor stuff, but... Because we were trapped in the car without anyone else to talk to, things escalated pretty quickly. We just pulled into a gas station outside Santa Fe when the fight started. He wanted me to go inside while he was filling up our tank so that I could buy snacks. I told him we already had plenty of snacks and I didn't want to waste money. He started screaming at me and I screamed back. It was pretty awful. Eventually I gave in and told him I'd buy him whatever he wanted. Then I left him at the car and stormed inside. The gas station was empty. No one was at the counter. I went to the bathroom to splash some water on my face. I needed to cool off. Then I came out, slowly browsed the snack aisles and picked up all Jeremy's favorites. Slowly I was able to calm down. The cashier came in from the back door. I assumed he was on a smoke break or something. He seemed nice enough and asked me how my day was going. Great, I told him, but I think you could tell from my voice that I was still annoyed. He handed me my bag of snacks. He had a big smile on his face and said, If you need anything else, let me know. I thanked him and left. When I got back outside, I saw that the car was gone. At first, I thought that Jeremy had pulled up to the side of the building because I was taking too long. But I looked around the car parking lot and found that the car wasn't there. I couldn't believe it. Jeremy left me in the middle of nowhere. This didn't seem like him at all. How could he do this to me? And more importantly, what was I going to do now? I pulled out my phone and called him, and he didn't pick up. It was a really hot day, and sweat oozed down my face. I walked back inside. Back so soon, the cashier asked. I explained that my boyfriend had ditched me here. I was so angry that the words barely came out of my mouth. The cashier walked around the counter and gave me a tight hug. I'm so sorry, he said. You don't deserve to be treated like that. I'd never met this man before, obviously, but I felt really comfortable in his arms. I could tell that he genuinely felt sorry for me. Eventually, he pulled away and offered me to hang out with him in the back of the store until Jeremy changed his mind and came back. It seemed like a good idea. At the very least, I'd be able to sit for a while and calm down. He led me to the little back room, which had a sofa, a table, and a small TV. The AC was on, so it was nice and cool. As I sat down, the man ran to the window and closed the curtain so the sunlight wouldn't be in my face. Then he sat next to me. My name is Tom, he said. Carly, I told him. It was awkward at first, but slowly we started talking. I told him all about my trip so far. I asked him what it was like to live in the middle of the desert. 
He seemed like a really nice, charming guy. He was also extremely handsome. Honestly, he was better looking than Jeremy. I asked him if he was dating anyone. Not at the moment, he said. But it's easy to find people. I flinched a little. That was kind of weird to say. We continued talking and I noticed that Tom kept glancing towards the curtain-covered window. I wasn't sure, but it seemed like he was hiding something just outside. I stood up pretending to stretch my legs and I walked over to the window. What are you doing? He snapped at me. That's when I knew he was definitely hiding something. He jumped up to stop me, but I was too fast. I pulled open the window and immediately saw what he was trying to hide. Our car parked behind the building, and Jeremy, still inside, slumped against the steering wheel. What the? You weren't supposed to see that, Tom said. He stepped closer until his face was inches from mine. What did you do? I heard the way he talked to you, Tom explains, and I couldn't stand it. You deserved better. So while you were in the bathroom, I went outside and took care of him. You killed him? I was trying to help you. You don't need someone like that in your life. I was too shocked to speak. He leaned closer and... The man was a psychopath. In his twisted brain, he thought that he was being chivalrous, that he was saving me. I pushed him away. Immediately, his face twisted into a furious scowl. You're just like all the others, you ungrateful idiot. He lunged at me, his large hand grabbing my shoulders and shoving me onto the cold floor. I struggled to twist out of his grip, but he pinned me to the floor. His shoulders struck the edge of the table, and the small TV crashed onto the floor. It narrowly missed my head. I won't let you go until you admit that I helped you. He screamed in my face. I couldn't push him off me, so I reached my arm towards the shattered TV at my side. Desperately, I grabbed onto a shard of glass. It sliced into my palm, but it didn't stop me. In one quick motion, I jammed the glass upward, piercing him in the side of the neck. His eyes shot open, and his hands loosened their grip. I pulled away from him and jumped to my feet. He was on his knees, trying to pull the glass from his neck. Don't pull it out, I told him, but he didn't listen. He yanked out the shard, and a splatter of blood burst out of him. In seconds, he collapsed to the ground. He wasn't dead yet, but he was very quickly bleeding out. I shakily pulled out my phone and called 911. By the time they came, Tom was dead. So was Jeremy. After giving my statement to the police, they let me go. I drove all the way back home. I still haven't told anyone what happened. I'm not strong enough. I can't believe that my whole life changed just because I'd gotten into an argument at a gas station. Natalie and I had been dating for three years before we finally broke up. I guess it was a long time coming. We'd been fighting over a lot of stupid stuff. Natalie was annoyed that I never took anything seriously. I was annoyed that she spent all her time at the gym doing yoga and stuff. I felt like she didn't value our time together. Neither one of us was to blame. It was just a case of irreconcilable differences. I was heartbroken, of course. I really did love her. After she moved out to live with her sister, I became a bit of a recluse. I stopped going out to all my favorite places because I worried that I'd run into her. I stopped seeing our mutual friends. I just threw myself into my job. One day, I had a mini panic attack in my house and I knew that I needed to go out and calm myself down. I hadn't eaten fast food in weeks, so I decided to walk over to the Chick-fil-A just a few streets over. I'd like to say that I chose the restaurant because I was in the mood for chicken but the truth is, I chose it because I knew that Natalie wouldn't be there. Natalie was always a bit of a health nut. She refused to eat at any fast food place unless she was really stressed, which almost never happened. I figured it would be the one place where I wouldn't run into her. I was wrong. When I got to the restaurant, I saw Natalie sitting in the corner. Maybe she was stressed after all. Maybe our breakup was hitting her as hard as it was me. 
Or maybe she was just in the mood for chicken. For a second, I thought I could just turn around and leave. But she noticed me right away. She smiled awkwardly and I waved back. I went up to the front counter to order. And while I was waiting, I felt obligated to walk over and talk to Natalie. I didn't sit down, though. I asked her how she was doing and she said that she was okay. She asked about my job. Neither of us revealed too much information about how we were doing. I really didn't want her to find out how much I missed her. The lady called me over to get my food, and I thanked God that my conversation with Natalie was over. I went to pick up my tray, when the door swung open and a man ran into the restaurant. He was about my age, but I could tell by his eyes that he was high on some kind of thing. His hands were trembling. He stumbled forward, looked straight at me, and screamed, You! You're dead! I'd never seen this man before in my life. Obviously, he'd totally lost it. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a switchblade. He pointed it at me and kept repeating that I was dead. I stumbled backward, hiding behind one of the tables. He just kept walking closer. Please, I said. I'm not who you think I am. But he wouldn't listen. The man froze for a second, and I thought he was finally coming to his senses. But then he laughed and dove at me. He jumped onto the table I was hiding behind and slid his body across the flat surface. I tried to get out of the way, but he grabbed me by the front of my shirt and pulled me toward him. He raised the switchblade, ready to slash at me. He was still laughing. Before he could cut me, though, something got in his way. Natalie! She jumped at the man and knocked the knife out of his hand. All those hours at the gym had really paid off. She was way stronger than I was. The knife flew across the air and clattered onto the floor. But that man wouldn't stop. He kicked Natalie off him and then grabbed me again. He didn't have his weapon anymore, but that didn't stop him from holding my neck and squeezing until I couldn't breathe. Please! I choked out. Shut up! He screamed in my face. After everything you did, you don't deserve to live! What was he talking about? The things he was ingesting must have made him extremely delusional. I turned toward Natalie. I couldn't say anything, so I just pleaded with my eyes. She had to help me. Natalie looked at me for a second, and then she glanced at the exit. Instantly, she spun around and ran outside. I couldn't believe it. My girlfriend of three years, the woman I thought I loved, was abandoning me? I couldn't breathe. I was going to die, and Natalie just left? Hold still, the crazy man shouted. He squeezed harder. I could hear the cashier shouting at him to stop. Why wasn't she calling the police? My vision got blurry. I was seconds away from passing out when I heard the door open again. I was too woozy to see what was happening. But the man let go of my neck and I collapsed onto the floor. It took me a few seconds to catch my breath again. I forced myself to look up and I saw Natalie standing at the front door. She was holding onto a man who looked a lot like me. He was tall and chubby, just like me. Same hair, same glasses. Even our outfits were similar. The man tried to run away, but Natalie held him tight. Natalie was about half his size, but she would not let go. God, I loved her so much. The crazy man walked toward them. Leave my boyfriend alone, Natalie said. You got the wrong person. I couldn't believe it. The man wasn't high after all. He'd just mistaken me for someone else. The man who looked like me started to whimper. I'm so sorry, he said. D don't kill me. You know I have to. The crazy man responded. It looked like the fight was going to restart, but thankfully a police car pulled into the parking lot. Two cops came out and asked what was going on. Natalie explained the situation as simply as she could, and the cops took both of the men away. I never found out what had caused the anger between them. It's probably best that I didn't know. Natalie ran toward me and asked me if I was okay. I am, I told her. Thanks to you. I saw that man hiding in the parking lot, she explained and he looked just like you. I figured that there was some sort of mix-up. I hope you didn't think I abandoned you. No, I lied. You probably won't be surprised to learn that Natalie and I got back together after that. The petty arguments we used to have just seemed so unimportant after my attack. We spend a lot more time together, and I even started joining her when she goes to the gym. I've already lost 15 pounds. We're better than ever, and nothing is going to come between us again.